the subject of today's discussion is the last part of Isaiah chapter 11 and all of chapter 12. Now, that isn't a lot of verses. That is, we're discussing the last seven verses of chapter 11 and all of chapter 12, which is just six verses. As we have noted already many times, the division of the books of the Bible into chapters is a relatively late phenomenon that does not by any means accord in a consistent manner with our tradition. And I think this is a unit for us to discuss, although I must admit we're going to have to abridge because while it's only 13 verses, a number of these verses could themselves justify an entire session. So without any further ado, let's commence with Isaiah chapter 11. We have already discussed through verse 9. We continue with verse 10. Verse 10 is about the first of several verses that we will be discuss discussing, not willing, today, that could be understood in more than one way. Specifically here, and it shall come to pass in that day that the root of Jesse, that stands as an ensign of the peoples, unto him shall the nations seek, and his resting place shall be glorious. Well, of course, referring to the Redeemer, the heir of the throne of David, as the root of Jesse is perfectly consistent with what we've been discussing since the beginning of chapter 11, when a shoot goes forth from the stock of Jesse. So this is, of course, in keeping with the same metaphor. The host of Assyria was also described as trees, the heir of the throne of David, the Redeemer. Ultimately, the Messiah is also likened to a tree coming forth from the root of Jesse. And what we read as the description of what happens in this verse is that the root of Jesse stands for an ensign of the peoples, an ensign, a banner, a place that serves as a signal for everyone to congregate. The truth is that the metaphor of an ensign is evocative of the way an army rallies its forces to a particular spot where the flag is raised, where the banner is being waved. And the military metaphor here inevitably is one that we can't help but contemplate. Because on the one hand, we should note that the same metaphor of the ensign appears in verse 12. And here, the meaning is clear. He will set up an ensign for the nations and will assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather together the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. That is, the ensign in verse 12 is indeed the congregating point for all the dispersed of Israel and Judah to come together. What if here in verse 10? It could indeed be understood similarly. Perhaps, indeed, not just for the dispersed of Israel, but an ensign of the peoples for all nations to congregate. But, you know, simultaneously, it's possible to understand the military metaphor as quite deliberate. This is an approach taken by some of the scholars in attempting to understand our passage. 
of course, inevitably, the associations in our minds abound. In particular, Ezekiel chapter 38, and as we'll consider momentarily also, Zechariah chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 38, well, the context indeed is the nation has returned to its land. There is an ingathering, and that occasions the final battle of the nations against God, the battle of Gog and Magog. We read in the vivid description of the prophet in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 4, I will unbridle you and put hawks into your jaws, and I will bring you forth, and all your army, horses, and horsemen, I will bring you forth as the prophet continues in verse 16 you shall come up against my people israel as a cloud to cover the land it shall be in the end of days and i will bring you against my land on the one hand of course there is free will there's no indication here that gog and magog are being coerced but on the other hand there is a purpose that the nations may know me when I shall be sanctified through you, O Gog, before their eyes. And indeed, when we consider what takes place, at least in this interpretation, in verse 10, initially, the root of Jesse being an ensign of the peoples may be summoning all of the nations that don't want the Redeemer, that don't want the Messiah to come to do battle against him. But ultimately, unto him shall the nations seek, and his resting place shall be glorious because of what happens. In verse 18, when God shall come against the land of Israel, that my fury shall arise up in my nostrils. Verse 21, and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, says God the Lord. Every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will enter into judgment with him, with pestilence and with blood, and I will cause to rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many peoples that are with him an overflowing shower and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will make myself known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am God. Now, of course, it should indeed go without saying, this is not because God needs the adulation. It's because we need to learn that God is indeed the focal point. We need to learn that all of that which God symbolizes for us Absolute truth, absolute righteousness, absolute justice, absolute goodness are indeed what reign supreme. And so, while the ensign again may be a summons to battle, ultimately, his resting place will be glorious. In much the same vein, as we already noted, in Zechariah chapter 14, we read another prophet's description of the same ultimate conclusion of the world as we know it. In verse 2, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be taken. Verse 3, then shall God go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, the mountain splits. In verse 5 we read, And God my Lord shall come and all the holy ones with you. And the ultimate conclusion in verse 9, much as we saw in Ezekiel chapter 38, 
and God will be king over all the earth. In that day shall God be one, and his name one. Ultimately, then, there is that conclusion. As we read in verse 11, Jerusalem shall dwell safely. Again, his resting place will be glorious. We know where that resting place is right here, Jerusalem. Now, whether this is the way to understand verse 10, that is, whether it indeed alludes to that final battle or not, certainly we appreciate that from verse 11, the theme very clearly is the ingathering of the dispersed. And it shall come to pass in that day that God will set his hand again, the second time, to acquire the remnant of his people. The remnant. Only a remnant will be left. That, the prophet tells us, he warns us. Many, most, will be lost. And that ingathering is from the various lands of the exile. We'll note in particular, Assyria and Egypt are mentioned here. We'll return to that in a moment. And again in verse 12, as we already saw, he will set up an ensign for the nations and will assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather together the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The theme of the gathering of exiles is one that indeed permeates the prophet's visions of the final restoration, the redemption. Indeed, not only the words of the prophets, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, this is the final conclusion of the exile. In verse 3, that God, your Lord, will return your captivity and have compassion upon you and will return and gather you from all the peoples where God, your Lord, had scattered you. If any of you that are dispersed be in the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence, Will God your Lord gather you, and from thence he will fetch you and bring you back to the land, the land that your father has possessed. Likewise, also not specifically in the words of the prophets, in one of the last of the Psalms, in Psalm 147, in verse 2, God does build up Jerusalem, he gathers together the dispersed of Israel, the final restoration, who heals the broken in heart, who binds up their wounds. And apropos of our specifically focusing, as we noted, on Assyria and Egypt, indeed, we see in the continuation in verse 16, there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people that shall remain from Assyria, like there was for Israel on the day that he came out of the land of Egypt. We see later on in Isaiah, in chapter 27, verses 12 and 13, it shall come to pass in that day that God will gather his fruit from the flood of the river, referring to the Euphrates, where Assyria is located unto the brook of Egypt, the Nile, the Egyptian exile, and you shall be gathered one by one, O you children of Israel. In verse 13, when the great horn, the great shofar is blown, they shall come that were lost in the land of Assyria, and they that were dispersed in the land of Egypt, and they shall prostrate themselves before God in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Now, we don't have time to consider by any means all of the passages in the prophets, 
that discuss the ingathering of the exiles in Ezekiel chapter 28, in chapter 36, and chapter 39 in Hosea, who is roughly a contemporary of Isaiah, we read of an ingathering as well. But there's an additional motif that we'll stress in Hosea. We see it, as we'll see shortly, in Ezekiel as well in chapter 37. And this is something to which the prophet refers briefly in speaking of assembling the dispersed of Israel and the scattered of Judah. But more specifically, in verse 13, the envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and they that harass Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. A long-standing tension. A tension, we must admit, that goes back to Genesis. Remember when Judah comes before Joseph, father of Ephraim, in pleading for the release of Benjamin. Judah, who was the one who first suggested, rather than simply leaving Joseph in the pit, selling him into slavery. Judah, Joseph, Judah, Ephraim, an ongoing tension an ongoing tension that found its awful culmination in the splitting of the kingdom after the death of King Solomon. Restoration means restoration of that oneness too. Because ultimately, restoration must come to terms with all the travails, all the problems, all the failings that happened in the long, sorry course of history up until then. So indeed, in that vein, in Hosea chapter 2, verse 2, the children of Judah and the children of Israel, which of course is the ten tribes, as it were, led by Ephraim, shall be gathered together. And they shall point, appoint themselves one head, one head, not two heads and shall go up out of the land, out of the lands of their dispersion. And uh, this becomes a recurrent theme indeed as well. Notably, in the prophecies of Jeremiah, Jeremiah prophesying at the end of the first commonwealth of Judah, long after the exile of the ten tribes of northern Israel, in describing the ultimate ingathering, an ingathering such that in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17, all the nations shall be gathered unto the throne of God, which is the name of Jerusalem. In verse 18, in those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel and they shall come together out of the land of the north. In Jeremiah chapter 30, in verse 3, the days come, says God, that I will turn the captivity of my people Israel and Judah again. A reunification. Those lost tribes, not lost forever. And indeed, in what follows, the prophecy of consolation and restoration, these are the words that God spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. In chapter 31, where once again there is that theme of restoration, in verse 6, sing with gladness for Jacob and shout at the head of the nations, announce you, praise you, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Note, again, 
it is but a remnant. In verse 7, behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the uttermost parts of the earth. And with them, the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travails with child together, a great company shall they return here. They shall come with weeping and with supplications and will, will I leave them. I will cause them to walk by rivers of water in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am become a father to Israel. And Ephraim is my firstborn. It's not just Judah. In verse 30, Behold, the days come, says God, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, both. Likewise, in chapter 33, I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as at the first. In the continuation of Jeremiah, chapter 33, in verse 14, behold, the days come, says God, that I will perform that good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and concerning the house of Judah. Ultimately, one king for them both. In those days and at that time will I cause a shoot of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. The ultimate restoration. Again, in chapter 50, in verse 4, in those days and in that time, it says God, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together. They shall go on their way weeping and shall seek God their Lord. In verse 20, in those days and in that time, it says God, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I leave as a remnant. In verse 33, God says, The children of Israel and the children of Judah are oppressed together. All that took them captives hold them fast and refuse to let them go. Their Redeemer, however, is strong. God of hosts is his name. They will be redeemed. Finally, in Jeremiah chapter 51, in verse 5, for Israel is not widowed, nor Judah, of his God, of the God of hosts. And indeed, then, there will be that restoration, that ingathering. Now, again, it's important for us to stress why this is so important. It's important because it's not a redemption if it doesn't reassess, reevaluate, and ultimately reconcile everything that happened in the past. This conflict of Judah and Ephraim slash Israel is one that has accompanied us, again, since the very beginning. True redemption means true reconciliation of everything. And indeed, in that vein, finally, perhaps the most vivid prophecy on the subject, Ezekiel chapter 37. God commands the prophet, in verse 16, Son of man, Take you one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel, his companions. And join them for you one to another into one stick, that they may become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak unto you, saying, will you not tell us what you mean by these? Say unto them, Thus says God, verse 19, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his companions, and I will put them unto him together with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick 
and they shall be one in my hand. And the prophet continues with the promise of that in gathering. In verse 21, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, whither they are gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Verse 24, and my servant David shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. That promise of restoration, indeed, is something that continues to reverberate in the words of the prophet Zechariah in the second temple period. Despite the fact that there has been an ingathering already of sorts, the end of the Babylonian exile, it's important to stress that no one was under any illusions that that ingathering was the address for all the prophecies that we have seen. If anything, it was merely a temporary respite preparation for the much, much longer road to exile that occurred afterward. So it is, in the words of Zechariah, this promise that ultimately I will cause the remnant of this people to inherit all these things. In verse 13, it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and you will be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. As we've noted, all the words of the prophets are directed at their contemporaries, but also for all generations to us. Now, I feel compelled to add here, if you would like to discern in everything I have said thus far, a guarantee that the 10 tribes are lurking someplace unnoticed and will be brought back, I have to concede. I don't know that. I think it's doubtful that there are uncharted lands where the ten tribes are lurking. I realize there are many peoples who provide at least a good deal of circumstantial evidence that they may be descended from the ten lost tribes various customs that seem almost transparently to be derived from traditional Jewish observance and that were preserved even in a somewhat distorted manner over the course of millennia. I'm also aware of a tradition that we have that the prophet Jeremiah himself brought back representatives of each of these lost tribes when in readying the nation for the Babylonian exile, he ensured that some presence of each of the tribes of Israel would always be there in the midst of the nation. What will actually happen, of course, we'll see in God's own time. Maybe that's an important theme for us to bear in mind for what follows as well, as we'll see shortly. But what we certainly need to stress isn't reading the words of the prophets as some tangible and utterly 
comprehensible description of what we will see. Because ultimately, we'll understand the words of the prophets fully, only, in retrospect, when we see that blessed day. But what it tells us, for us, now, today, is this very realization. There's so much in the past, so much pain, so much anguish, so much suffering, a redemption that does not signify some ultimate reconciliation that redresses all those wrongs, even down to this tension that was a festering sore in Israel for millennia. A redemption that does not address and redress all these is not truly a redemption. So the prophets emphasize what they are envisioning is indeed such a redemption. Now, in much this vein as well, we consider another set of tensions. And this admittedly is expressed in rather bold and even harsh terms. In verse 14, again in chapter 11, after Judah and Ephraim, that is Judah and the rest of Israel, are reunited, they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines on the west. Together shall they spoil the children of the east. They shall put forth their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. On the one hand, these exploits, these military campaigns, are transparently evocative of what we read in the second book of Samuel in chapter 8 regarding the military exploits of King David. Beginning at the chapter's beginning, in chapter 8, verse 1, David smote the Philistines and subdued them. Verse 2, he smote Moab. In verse 3, he smote also Hadad Ezer, the son of Rehob, king of Tzoba. In verse 6, he put garrisons in Aram of Damascus, and the Arameans became servants to David. And indeed, in the continuation, there is gold and brass, many gifts that these subdued nations bring to David. There are also other gifts. In verses 9 and 10, we read of the votive gifts that Toi, the king of Hamat, sends to King David via his son, vessels of silver, vessels of gold, vessels of brass. And what happens with all these vessels? These also did King David dedicate unto God with the silver and gold that he dedicated of all the nations which he subdued, of Aram, of Moab, of the children of Ammon, of the Philistines, of Amalek, of the spoiled Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Tzoba. All of the victories were part of the way King David was preparing the world for God's holy temple on earth. In the last verse of this passage, we read in verse 15, and David reigned over all Israel, and David executed justice and righteousness unto all his people. So it's important for us to see all of this, all of this, in the exploits that happen in the future as well, again in chapter 11, verse 14, as part of a process. We do believe the entire world willingly or by force will come to this ultimate realization. There is no greater gift than this. Now, if we ask, what are we to learn from this passage? Of course, 
besides the dedication to the temple, as we see it expressed in the previous verse, God saved David whithersoever he went. Ultimately, all of this is God's doing. King David is merely the proxy, as are Judah and Ephraim and the rest of Israel in Isaiah chapter 11. It is indeed in that vein that we read likewise in Psalm 60 and Psalm 108 in almost the same words about the exploits of King David that ultimately subordinate all of the nations to he who led me unto Edom, to God. And indeed we should note that it is in fairly similar terms in describing a future to come that we see many of the same themes articulated by the prophet Obadiah in the end of the one chapter of his prophecy in verse 18 the house of jacob shall be a fire and the house of joseph a flame the house of esau for stubble and they shall kindle in them and devour them and there is mention not only of esau but of the philistines and of the gilad the nations to the east very similar indeed to what we saw in isaiah chapter 11. What is, for our purposes, most crucial, really, is the final verse in Avadya, chapter 1, the only chapter, in verse 21. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be God's. They're all going to recognize that. That's also part of the reconciliation. Remember, on the one hand, verse 13 speaks of reconciliation on an internal plane. On the plane of Judah and Ephraim, that is, Judah and the ten tribes, becoming reconciled with one another. In verse 14, it is of international scope. But it's critical likewise, because a redemption that doesn't come to terms with all of the pain and anguish and suffering of the past is not redemption. And we then read in verses 15 and 16 what clearly is a throwback to the past, also pertaining to the ingathering of the exiles. In verse 15, God will utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea and with the strength of his wind will he lift his hand over the river and will smite it into seven streams and cause men to march over dry shod. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people that shall remain from Assyria, like as there was for Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Of course, inevitably we realize this is a reinvocation of the miracles of the splitting of the sea in Exodus chapter 14, where in verse 21, we read how Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and God led the sea by a strong east wind all the night and made the sea dry land and the waters were cleft and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them, on their right hand and on their left. And, of course, this miracle is one that happens not only once at the time of the exodus from Egypt, but also again in crossing the Jordan. That is, we read in Joshua chapter 3, Verse 16, that when the feet of the priests bearing the ark dipped into the brink of the water, verse 16, that the waters which came down from above stood 
and rose up in one heap a great way off from Adam, the city that is beside Sarathan, and those that went down toward the sea of the Arava, the Salt Sea, were wholly cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stored firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, while all Israel passed over on dry ground. So, the miracles of the Exodus will indeed recur as encapsulated in Psalm 66, verse 6. God turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. Let us rejoice in him. And of course, it is in this vein that we appreciate so vividly, so well, that the ingathering, again, is a restoration that brings us associations going all the way back to the beginning of our history. Because a redemption that doesn't enable us to come to terms with everything that came before, again, is not truly a redemption. Now, this completes the description of the ingathering, the process of redemption, as it is outlined in chapter 11. Again, we are including in our discussion of these verses at the end of chapter 11, all of chapter 12. And chapter 12 provides us not so much with a description of God's salvation, but rather with a description of its songs. The songs that accompany that salvation. Verse 1, admittedly, a verse subject to a great deal of ambiguity as to how best to translate it. In that day, you shall say, I will give thanks unto you, O God. Now, a possible translation, which is the first one that I include here is, for though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. I have to admit that while that is a plausible translation, it doesn't really accord with the literal sense of the Hebrew. A better way of directly translating from the Hebrew would be, I will give thanks unto you, O God, for you were angry with me. That's part of the thanks, that you were angry. When your anger is turned away, you comfort me. Or somewhat similarly, I give thanks for you were angry at me. May your anger turn away, and may you comfort me. So, of course, when we consider what the prophet is really telling us here, what exactly the relationship is between God's anger and his comfort isn't clear. I have to admit, however, that I do feel something of a partiality toward the second and third alternatives. I reiterate that a simple reading of the Hebrew does not imply, though you were angry with me. It simply states, I give thanks unto you, for you were angry with me. Which, of course, I realize challenges us. Why should you give thanks for God having been angry with you? Why give thanks for God's chastisement? The truth of the matter is that we have another example of much the same theme, but I have to admit that here too, the correct translation is 
subject to differences of opinion. In Psalm 118, I'm going to first direct our attention to verse 21, which is where the ambiguity is angered, and where the similarity to Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1, is most acute. I will give thanks unto you, either for you have answered me and are become my salvation, or for you afflicted me and are become my salvation. Now, I hope we aren't getting too complex and elusive here. But of course, appreciate that the second translation is very similar to the alternative translation that we discussed in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1. Here, in Psalm 118, I will give thanks unto you, for you afflicted me, and are become my salvation. It's not a contradiction. And again, in much the same vein, almost the same words. I will give thanks unto you, O God, for you were angry with me, which is also a kind of affliction, but you also comfort me. May you comfort me. There is that comfort that comes afterward. But there's also the affliction. I feel compelled to share with you in this understanding of Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1, we have in our tradition a kind of uh, anecdotal elaboration. And I'm going to apologize at the outset in sharing this with you because it may even offend you as being, oh, so cliched. And I admit it is. The story of someone who is on his way on a major business venture and gets a thorn in his foot, breaks his leg, misses the boat, and is on the verge of blaspheming. He's so furious. God, why do you do this to me? And he continues in this state of rage until you can probably anticipate what's coming next. He gets word that the ship went down at sea with all hands on board and realizes that you were angry with me, that you afflicted me. It was my own good. I didn't understand. The truth is that when we consider what's taking place in Psalm 118, it really does seem that this is the theme expressed by the psalmist. Because in verse 18, God has chastened me sore, but he has not given me unto, uh, over unto death. And it's in the wake of that, in verse 19, that I will give thanks unto God. And that in verse 21, again, we will read, I will give thanks unto you for you afflicted me. Likewise, verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected, experiencing rejection, chastisement, affliction, that stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And ultimately the realization, this is God's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. We could never have anticipated this. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We didn't have a clue. We didn't understand. That realization that we don't understand is perhaps, at least on the most basic plane, one of the central messages of the dialogue between God and Job. 
from Job chapter 38 and on. When God, at the beginning of chapter 38, challenges Job, verse 2, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now your loins like a man, for I will ask you and declare it unto me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell, if you have the understanding. And there is indeed a very long litany of challenges with respect to which ultimately Job's response in chapter 40 in verses 4 and 5 is, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer again. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. And ultimately in chapter 42, beginning in verse 2, I know that you can do everything, and that no thought, no discretion can be withholding from you. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? That was God's challenge, remember? Therefore have I uttered that which I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, and I did not know. Verse 6, wherefore I abhor my words and repent, seeing I am dust and ashes. We don't understand. We give thanks, indeed, for the affliction, for the anger, what we think is anger, what seems to us to be anger, what seems to us to be affliction. Once we feel God's comfort, we experience God's salvation, we see how little we understood. There are many factors here in this lack of understanding. On the most basic plane, and we've discussed this previously, Psalm 90, verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Our perspective is so limited. The anecdote about the person who misses the boat. I think we're justified in griping. It's just so cliched, so trite. But it doesn't mean it's not true. Our problem is, in the overwhelming majority of instances, you don't get your answer in a period of days or weeks or months. Or even years, to take decades, lifetimes, centuries, in order to be able to understand what was happening here. We have noted this in the context of God's discourse with Moses in Exodus chapter 33. When God tells Moses in verse 20, you cannot see my face, for man cannot see me while alive. What can you see? In verse 23, I will take away my hand and you will see a chorai, which we can render as, you will see what follows from me. But my face shall not be seen not what comes in front. We look back. Oh, now I understand. We look back and we can see in the light of redemption how there is indeed that reconciliation. How now everything makes sense. But at the time, at the time, nothing made any sense. It's only once we get there that there'll be that dawning realization. This is perhaps 
the thrust of the opening verse of Psalm 126. A song of sense. When God brings back those that return to Zion, we were like unto dreamers. Now, grammatically, there's a problem here. When God brings back those that return to Zion, and brings is a more rigorous translation than brought, that's obviously referring to something that will be in the future. We were, as dreamers, is conjugated in the past tense. Shouldn't it be, we will be like dreamers? And a proposal of some of the Bible scholars, 19th century, the ethics movement in Eastern European Jewry, is it's not referring to we will be like dreamers at the time of the redemption. It's that at the time of the redemption, we will look back and say, we were dreaming. A dreamer has, of course, a distorted sense of reality because he's in the middle of a dream. So that, for example, if there's a thunderstorm outside, he may hear the claps of thunder, and in his dream, they are canon. He's interacting with reality, but it's not really real. It's not reality as it is. It's reality as he misperceives it because he's dreaming. At the time of the redemption, we'll be able to look back and recognize we were dreaming. We didn't see clearly. We only saw a superficial veneer. We didn't understand what was going on beneath the surface. Now, truth be told, this operates in both directions. That is, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, in verses 12 and 13, we read, There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches kept by the owner thereof to his hurt. That is, not kept by the owner, on behalf of the owner. He has these riches, this wealth. He thinks it's great. Someone finds out he won the lottery. He's rejoicing, completely oblivious of the realization that that one event, winning the lottery, will completely unravel his life, ruin everything. And those riches are lost by evil adventure. And he will beget a son who will have nothing in his hand. And all that wealth was only to his detriment. He thought, he understood, he understood nothing. Only in retrospect does it become clear, again, both negatively and positively. So when I experience affliction at the hand of God, when I experience that God is angry at me, really, properly, I don't have a clue what's really happening, what will ultimately come of it. And that brings me to a deeper level. And we've noted this deeper level on other occasions as well, but it certainly is critical in particular in considering the thrust of Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1. A couple of brief illustrative examples. In Exodus chapter 5, after Moses comes before Pharaoh, what happens? Everything gets fearsomely, unbelievably, and precipitously worse. Not better, worse. From verse 6, the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no more give the people straw to make brick. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tally of the bricks, which they did make heretofore, you shall lay upon them. You shall not diminish aught thereof. Let them work. Verse 9, Let heavier work be laid upon the men, 
that they may labor therein, and let them not regard lying words, these promises of redemption, preposterous. And so, we read in verse 12, the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And the taskmasters were urgent, saying, fulfill your work, your daily task is when there was straw. And the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten, saying, wherefore have you not fulfilled your appointed task in making brick both yesterday and today as heretofore? Never underestimate the grievous, unpardonable crime in one innocent person suffering. And here's not just one. And so we read in the continuation of Exodus chapter 5, the encounter between the officers and Moses and Aaron. In verse 21, they said unto them, May God look upon you and judge, because you have made our Savior to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hands to slay us. What are you doing here? Redeemers. Ha! And Moses himself is completely shaken. Moses returned unto God and said, Lord, wherefore have you dealt ill with this people? Why is it that you sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has dealt ill with this people. Neither have you delivered thy people at all. What are you doing? And in our tradition, as I've shared with you, what in fact is happening beneath the surface is that it's time for the plagues of Egypt to be unleashed upon the Egyptians in all their fury. But there is one thing holding it back, and that is that if the plagues are unleashed and the only criminal who has been holding back the redemption of Israel is Pharaoh, the Egyptians will complain, and justifiably. They'll say, Pharaoh's sinning and we're getting punished? And that complaint was enough to abort the process of redemption. The plagues could not begin. The redemption could not unfold because of that complaint of the Egyptians who would then say, we are innocent victims. So what happens? What happens is Pharaoh, in keeping with his attitude, deprives the people of straw. But it's not just Pharaoh anymore. Wait. In verse 12, it was, so the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. All the land of Egypt just to find some straw? What's so hard about finding straw? In all the fields, after the harvest, there is straw galore. No one wants it. No one has anything to do with it. It is, therefore, essentially ownerless. What was the problem? Gathering straw, just as the Egyptians had gathered it for the Israelites beforehand. And again, in our tradition, it's not written here explicitly, but why indeed were they scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt? Because whenever they would go into someone's field to ask for some straw, the Egyptian would beat him up and chase him away. You're not taking straw from my field. And so they had to scatter throughout all the land of Egypt. Such suffering, such pain, such anguish, such meanness. Meanness. Uh, of the Egyptians, not just the Pharaoh. Ah. Remember what was obstructing redemption moving forward? That the Egyptians would be able to say they're innocent? They're not innocent anymore. Now, indeed, the plagues will be unleashed with all their fury, not just upon Pharaoh, but upon all of Egypt. And indeed, God's response to Moses, chapter 6, verse 1, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For by a strong hand shall he let them go, and by a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. Because the last obstruction is gone. 
you thought it was retreating. You thought things were just getting worse. The darkest moment is just before the dawn breaks. We see much the same thing in Esther chapter 7, when immediately after Esther discloses that the wicked Haman is the adversary and the enemy, immediately afterward, what happens? What happens is the king disappears. The king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. And Haman is there alone in the room with Esther. Can you imagine how terrifying? Here she is, alone, with the man whom she has just indicted, and there's no king around to protect her. Again, when you think the redemption should move forward, when you think things should get better, all of a sudden, they've gotten worse. Terribly worse. But only for a moment. In verse 8, Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the couch where Aunt Esther was. Then said the king, Will he even force the queen before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. That was it. It was just a moment. A moment, but... Remember, a thousand years are for God, just like a day that is past and watching the night. That moment can stretch on and on and on for us. We see the darkness. We don't see the light. But this is the challenge. And this is why that song of redemption where again we remember, redemption means necessarily a reconciliation of everything that came before. That song needs to deal not only with what happens when you comfort me, but also when you are angry with me, when I'm suffering, when I'm in darkness, when I'm falling. In Micha chapter 7, verse 8, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I am fallen, I am arisen. When I sit in darkness, God is a light unto me. And again, in our tradition, we uh, append to this the realization. If I would not have fallen, I would not have arisen. If I would not sit in darkness, God would not be my light. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, we read, A righteous man falls seven times and rises up again. And uh, one of the great rabbinical scholars of the last generation commented on this verse, Rabbi Isaac Hutner, that superficial readers think it means even though the righteous man falls, he rises again. But those with more penetrating insight understands doesn't mean he falls and nevertheless rises again. The righteous have the insight, the perseverance, the commitment to transform every fall into a rise. The wicked just stumble in their evil and they remain down because they don't have that dedication. They don't have that devotion. They don't have that commitment. It is through the falls that you rise. And again then, it is through the anger that we experience, that we get to that comfort afterward. Indeed, in that vein, when Jeremiah describes that redemption, that ingathering. In chapter 31, verse 12, Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, and the young men and old, the old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy, and will comfort them, and make them rejoice. We could 
read the continuation as from their sorrow, but perhaps better through, because of their sorrow. Through the falls, rise. Through the morning, you are comforted. That, most essentially, is the theme. And that, of course, is also the basis of the continuation. In chapter 12, verse 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. Why specifically the trust here? And perhaps, once again, the answer lies in what we've observed with respect to the process of redemption, coming to terms with all the negative in the past. When you see that the worst calamities, even the times that we thought God was angry, the times that we thought God was afflicting, are really the basis of the salvation. That really teaches us more than anything else. We need to have trust. He knows what he's doing. And so indeed, we put our trust in God. And, you know, in this regard as well, we'll stress in particular that the trust is what comes in the face of the calamities. Returning to Psalm 118, which we discussed previously, out of my straits, we read in verse 5, I called upon God. He answered me with great enlargement. And that's why now I realize, verse 6, God is with me, I will not fear. God is my helper. It is better to take refuge in God than to trust in man, in princes, in anything else. Because he really does justify the trust we place in him. The continuation of verse 2, another passage that is subject to more than one possible translation, is almost precisely the same words that we find besides in this citation from the prophets, in Exodus chapter 15, and in Psalm 118. This is an almost unique example of a verse that appears almost identically in the Torah, the five books of Moses, in the prophets, and in the hagiographer, the holy writings, the three divisions of the Hebrew Bible. What does it mean? Well, the second half of the verse here, which is the part that appears in Exodus and in Psalms as well, could be read as... God, the Lord, is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. It could be read as, for the strength and song of God, the Lord, is become my salvation, and perhaps on a radically different plane. The Hebrew word, vizimrat, that could be related to song, and indeed, it is related to song, the same root, in verse 5, sing unto God, zammeru, from the same three-letter root as zimrat, that root can also refer to cutting. Pruning is lizmo, same root. So the third possibility for translating would be for the strength and cutting of God the Lord has become my salvation. Where by cutting, we mean literally pruning. Well, at this point, I think you can well anticipate which of these alternative translations I prefer. This third possibility, which is the possibility proposed by the great 
scholar, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, known by the acronym Rashi, one of the great sages of the end of the 11th and beginning of the 12th century. This third possibility, of course, inevitably accords with everything we've said about affliction and suffering. It's not just the strength of God the Lord has become my salvation. It's also he's cutting, pruning. When you prune a tree, well, we don't know that trees feel any kind of pain, but it certainly is a traumatic experience for the tree. And yet you know that by you pruning the tree, you'll make it grow better. So, what was my salvation? It's got strength, but it's also maybe not merely the song, but the cutting, the pruning, the pain and the anguish that ultimately enable us to get to that final resolution, reconciliation, and conclusion. It is, of course, noteworthy that besides the obvious in Exodus chapter 15, this is the second verse of the Song of the Sea, that this coming, not just after being saved from the Egyptians, this coming after all of the miserable years of bondage in Egypt. It was indeed, in the end, we see, not just your song, your strength and your cutting, that are become our salvation. Even having to scramble for straw over the whole land of Egypt, that's also part of the salvation. And indeed, in Psalm 118, we already saw all the suffering beforehand. In verse 13, you did thrust sore at me that I might fall. Whether you is referring to the enemy or maybe God, God still helped me. And again, it is not merely the song. It is the strength and the cutting, the pruning of God that has become my salvation. Returning to Isaiah chapter 12. Therefore, with joy, with joy shall you draw water out of the fountains of salvation. And in that day you shall say, give thanks unto God, call in his name. Declare his doings among the peoples. Make mention that his name is exalted. And I can only append here, I realize we need to be concluding, that when we speak about God being exalted, we've seen that theme in the Hebrew, Nisgav. Earlier on in Isaiah, in chapter 2, God alone will be exalted in that day, in chapter 2, verse 11, and likewise in verse 17. There's an emphasis on God alone. But likewise, in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 5, God is exalted, same word, for he dwells on high. He's not on the same level as anything else. In Psalm 148, once again, let them praise the name of God, for his name alone is exalted, alone. Only God knows. We get such a small picture. Only God truly guides us towards that ultimate salvation that otherwise we would never understand. And finally, the two concluding verses of chapter 12, we'll note in much the same vein as what we've said until now. Verses 5 and 6, sing unto God, for he has done majestically. This is made, made known in all the earth. So again, all the earth knows 
and seemingly as an anticlimax. Verse 6, cry aloud and sing praises, you inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of you. Great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of you. But didn't we read in the previous verse that God's having done majestically is made known in all the earth? And of course, apropos of what we've been saying all along, perhaps the answer is clear. And that is, you know, sometimes, especially when we are living through all of the suffering, all of the travails, all of the anguish, all of the pain and the misery, others, ironically, can see God's hand faster than we, than we can. We noted earlier the words of Psalm 126, with which we'll now conclude. A song of a sense, when God brings back those that return to Zion, we were like unto those that dream. And in verses 2 and 3, we see an interesting and maybe at this point familiar progression then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongues with singing then said they among the nations god has done great things with these verse three god has done great things with us we are rejoiced they said among the nations God has done great things with these before we said ourselves, God has done great things with us. I remember many years ago, an acquaintance telling me of a conversation that, we, that he had had with a friend of his from among the Makoya group. For those who aren't familiar, a group of devout Christian believers in Japan who are very passionate believers in God's promises to Israel and great lovers of Israel. And um, he commented to his Makoya friend, how is it that you folks are able to understand what's happening here, are able to see God's promises fulfilled when, truth be told, many of us, Israel, falter and don't have that level of clarity. And his friend predictably responded by quoting precisely these verses in Psalm 126. It's the nation's that are first able to recognize God has done great things with these, with Israel, before we're able to see God has done great things with us, we are rejoiced. And maybe it's for the same reasons that we've been exploring all along in today's session. Because redemption really does demand of us coming to terms with everything. Taking stock. The ultimate. Re-evaluation, reassessment, reconciliation. Of all the suffering. All the misery, all the anguish, all the darkness. The exile everything that went into readying us for that final redemption. To be able to see how all of that somehow is itself redeemed in that redemption, because it was all part of a plan, because it all was leading to a final resolution. To do that, 
such a challenge? First of all, reconfronting all that pain and anguish. But second of all, when you're living in all that pain and anguish, how can you possibly make sense of it? And the truth is that those who are among the nations will maybe have a bit more of an objective view, can take a couple of steps backward and consider the picture without everything that the one who's living through all these events cannot help but bring to bear that such a person is much better equipped coming from the vantage point of the nations to see, to know God has done great things with these. Only afterward, there's that dawning appraisal. God has done great things with us. We are rejoiced. And so, when we consider where these verses lead us, and where they provisionally for now leave us, we have that summons, sing unto God. And, you know, as we've already noted, this is an inescapable verity. The root letters of this word, sing, zameru, are identical to the root letters of pruning, cutting. So here we'll unequivocally translate as sing unto God. But maybe in our singing unto God, that song is going to cut deeply into us. It's going to demand of us to come to terms with so much pain, so many things that we've never come to terms with. So much of a past, soaked with blood and tears. And of course, while Isaiah's words pertain to the global cosmic redemption, the redemption of the nation, the redemption of the world, you really can't help but apply them to the redemption of each and every one of us as an individual. We all, after all, are so thirsty for redemption. So much in our lives remains unredeemed, unresolved, unreconciled. And these words of Isaiah hold out a promise for us all. Because there is something taking place, but it's below the surface. We don't see it. We didn't see it. We still don't see it. But we will see it. We may need help. It may be sooner made known in all the earth than in our own innermost selves. But ultimately, we will know, great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of you. And this is my closing blessing to us all. May we have at least some taste in our mouth of that redemptive process. Feel something of the sweetness together with all the bitterness of everything else. To be able to sense how indeed, in the words of Psalm 126, God has done 
and is doing great things with us. Even in the darkest night, God continues to do great things with us. May we be blessed to feel it, to taste it, to know it. God bless you.